गुड थैंक यू Uh, we can go full screen this like screen thank you uh, shaka let me welcome all, all of you to 106th episode of thursday musings on a very uh, important topic tdcs how to set up the clinic and how to run it so our good friend dr umesh is there for us today uh, the ground rules are simple uh, everyone is on the mute mode the panelists will be, uh, be able to unmute themselves you can post the questions in the chat box we can take a select few uh, live questions uh, and uh, yeah that will be all. next slide please Please continue the slide share. Next slide. Hey, no slide is being seen. Ha, slide share has stopped. Where to start the slide? So let me continue without being silent. Thank you, Dr. Alim. for chatting the program and in this program we have got to very much active very much well known and very much very popular moderator dr lim siddiqui professor of psychiatry and who is a treasurer of indian psychiatric society and dr amrit patjoshi professor of psychiatry in high tech medical college and who is a uc member of indian psychiatric society both of them are quite by brand quite active in indian psychiatric society and now we will move on to introduce our third person speaker try this uh, slide share is ready please make it full screen Sure. Please make it full screen. Just a moment, I'm trying. You start from Doctor Kumar, and it is okay. To make it slide, so make it. Is it visible yeah. now? Yeah, yeah, quite visible. so we have got our as our chairperson dr t kumaran from madurai he is retired professor and head of the department of psychiatry madurai medical college he is post graduate teacher for last 22 years as dr t gives train and is a post graduate examiner in various medical universities he is past president of indian psychiatric society tamil nadu chapter 2021 22 he is past secretary of indian psychiatric society tamil nadu advance 2013 to 2017 he is chairman of cmi Sub committee of IPS South Zone, 2016 to 2017, is very active academically as well as in organization. His areas of interest: PG teaching and BIS in psychiatry. Welcome, Dr. Kumaran. And I take this opportunity to welcome Dr. Anil Rane. Next slide, please. He is from Goa, beautiful Goa. He is superintendent and assistant professor of psychiatry in the Institute of Mental Health and Behavioral Sciences. He is ex-president of Indian Psychiatric Society, Goa Trust Fund. He has 16 years of teaching experience and he has got 14 publications to his credit. His area of interest are the addiction and community psychiatry. Welcome, Dr. Rane. With this, I hand over the further proceedings of this meeting to our chairperson, assistant chairperson, Dr. Rane and Dr. Kumaran and Shaman. Who will introduce the speaker, sir? Uh, first, uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, good evening, all. I am Dr. Kumaran from Madurai, 
I am very happy to be with the uh, Indian Psychiatric Society Odisha State Branch uh, members. Uh, in fact, I am very much uh, uh, privileged to be with the elite group that's conducting a uh, online meet for the past uh, almost uh, 106 meet. I am very happy that it has uh, crossed the century. And uh, I am a retired professor. I just retired two months ago. And I was uh, very much surprised to hear from Dr. Topan because I was associated with him before 10 years in the IPS activities in the national board. I know him very well and I'm very happy. And uh, my respects to the co chairperson, Dr. Anil Rane, uh, series chairman, Dr. Topan Pati, moderators, Dr. Amrit Patu Joshi, and uh, Dr. Alim Siddiq. Uh, let me introduce the uh, prestigious product of uh, CAP Ranchi, Dr. Umesh, who is going to talk about our uh, uh, TDCS pragmatics today. He is a consultant psychiatric in geriatric epilepsy and neurology clinic at CAP, uh, mostly a neuropsychiatrist, and he has published 30 articles in national and inter international journals. And he has authored 14 book chapters in reputed textbooks. He is the editorial member of uh, IJPM and he is. Uh, uh, also the member in the frontiers in human neuroscience uh, and qualitative research, all said journals. And his areas of interest, geriatric psychiatry, schizophrenia, high resolution EEG in psychiatric disorders, and non-invasive brain stimulation, which he is going to tell about us, which is supposed to be a very old uh, uh, revolution that, uh, that occurred uh, before three centuries. It is, uh, even though the uh, electrical stimulation uh, therapy is uh, very old, uh, it was dropped in the 19th century and it started uh, uh, surfacing, resurfacing again in the 20th century. And I think it has become practical and applic uh, the applications are useful in our uh, practical setup now. So I am also eager to hear from him because we have been using this ECT. And uh, when I was a student, I, have, I must have given at least 1,000 ECTs because I did my MBBS, uh, DPM and MD in Madhuri Middle College. So every day there will be a session. So uh, this is the new uh, innovation. It's a non-invasive also, and that has been showing promises in certain areas and uh, in long lasting changes also in the brain in the form of neuroplasticity and other things. So I am also eager to hear about Dr. Umesh who is uh, doing research on this and is uh, practicing it. And uh, over to Dr. Uh, Anil Rane for his uh, uh, introductory words. Uh Please stop sharing the screen. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank all the organizers, uh, Dr. Pati sir and his entire team, uh, Siddiqui sir and uh, Amrit, and uh, for everybody wanting, uh, calling me here to chair this uh, very interesting session. And I will not take much time. And of course, a hearty congratulations for having 106 editions. That's more than two years. And it takes a lot of effort to have a program like this running continuously. It's it's uh, congratulations to the entire team. And of course, I will not uh, uh, waste any more time and let the speaker, uh, Dr. Umesh, carry forward with his uh, presentations for today. And then we'll again at the end of the session come together for discussions. Thank you. Uh, may I share the screen? Is the screen visible? Yes, quite visible. Okay. So first of all, uh, sincere thanks to all the organization, uh, organizers, to Parpati sir, uh, Alim Siddiqui sir, uh, my beloved senior, as well as uh, Amrit sir, my uh, very favorite senior, for uh, giving us the opportunity in one of the prestigious uh, music series. And congratulations to the team uh, for uh, celebrating more than 100 uh, sessions of uh, music and successfully carrying forward. Uh, and it's been really an honor to speak in front of the stalwarts of uh, psychiatry. So uh, my topic today would be, uh, I'll be discussing mostly about the transcranial direct current stimulation. Perhaps I'll talk more about the pragmatic aspects, which will help perhaps uh, in uh, the routine clinical practice, which we in fact do it on a regular basis. I provide an acknowledgement or thank uh, the 
Technical Research Center for Neuromodulation in Psychiatry for giving the academic inputs. We are the part of team, uh, Niman, CIP, and KMC Manipal, who have been collaboratingly working in the field of neuromodulation. So before going to the neuromodulation, as uh, Sir was rightly mentioning that uh, uh, neuromodulation was practiced even in the, the uh, earlier days. Perhaps if you go back to the BC, it's a movie, uh, to, 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 to second or third century BC, they used to use a torpedo fishes, which actually has uh, electricity uh, that can uh, provide to the, uh, I mean, uh, as, as a defense mechanism. So these torpedo fishes were used to treat headaches in the past. But somehow it went uh, below the or maybe the transcranial electrical stimulation in treating various neurological as well as psychiatric disorders. So uh, what do you mean by the neuromodulation uh, basically? It is, it is basically a non-invasive treatment, which is uh, perhaps uh, by providing some stimulation to the brain and it has a therapeutic utility and that has been claimed for perhaps more than two or three decades. It is found to be efficient some of the experiments have been saying robust evidence about transcranial neuromodulation and they say that as compared to the ECT as well as pharmacotherapy, there are lower number of adverse effects. And there are mostly the therapeutic possibilities have been exponentially increasing because lots of people at different part of the continent have been using a transcranial neuromodulation as a monotherapy or as an augmentation to pharmacotherapy and or psychotherapy. So if you look into the publications overall, in just 2002, there were hardly 10 to 20 publications, but if you can see in the year 2020 or perhaps more than that, you can see more than 200 articles that has been published specifically in transcranial direct current stimulation, focusing on various psychiatric disorders. So this is one of the, I mean, you can see that there's a surge of publication maybe since 2010 onwards. And this is primarily because there are lots of researchers, maybe we are getting a lot of evidences, maybe Nietzsche's team at uh, Germany and other places, maybe some uh, Canada people from Canada, in from, from uh, there are lots of evidence from Nimans, Bengaluru, there are lots of evidence from CIP Ranji. This is in fact a very promising uh, thing to understand that uh, uh, transcranial direct current stimulation or maybe uh, neuromodulation is, is uh, taking a pick up and uh, perhaps after a few years, it could be one of the important line of treatment in patients with psychiatric disorders. So if we look into the timeline of for TDCS innovation, so we can see that there are different methods and there are over the period of time, there has been lots of technological advancement that has occurred. So earlier it was the later part of the, uh, say uh, maybe after 2010, you can see that it has come to a handheld device and later tablet based and even the current era, we are able to find even the dye electrodes because conventionally we use sodium chloride soaked electrodes, but even now we can see that there are dry electrodes and even there are neuro very specific neurotargeting methods where, uh, 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 in which we can spe specifically stimulate a particular region of the brain. So just going into the basics, uh, if you look into the various uh, physics aspect, if you go into the school the textbooks, uh, which are taught in the schools, they say that uh, anode, uh, the, the electricity, the, the electrons passes from the anode to the cathode. But what happens in the brain? This is very much important. So there is a direction of the current flow inside the brain. From anode to the, the electricity passes from the anode and the, the amplitude, the, 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 and the duration in the current uh, practice. When it comes to pragmatics is the TDC, uh, TDCS device, which is basically a uh, DC battery driven. So there are electrodes which are connected to that, where basically it is uh, rubber electrodes, which is connected through wires. There are sponge pockets for the electrodes. So which is basically soaked in sodium chloride solution. So if we require ultimately a sodium chloride solution, an ACL solution, we require head straps in order to fix these electrodes to the area of interest. We need measuring tape, we need marker, and we need charts and pens. This is enough to set up a lab. So uh, 
if we see that uh, if you compare this with a uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation because it's a very big device and it's uh, it requires a lot of space there is a lot of noise which comes around so in, in but when it come, if you compare with uh, tdcs perhaps you require a smaller room maybe you don't uh, if, if there is no much distraction and the this much is enough and if you have the tdcs device and if you know what is the practice what is the standard practice what are the guidelines how to follow that and what needs to be done that's enough to start a tdc tdc setup so there are various standard devices so i'm not i don't have any conflict of interest but uh, despite the fact i can uh, suggest few names there are neurocon sotrix tascam there are lots of that are available so there are commercially available devices and uh, they have uh, various safety guidelines that has been uh, provided to the various companies so that is uh, uh, what i could share in the present slide so if you look into the vital parameters what is important is the electrode size the smaller the electrode the more focal the stimulation would be electrode positioning would be very vital because uh, if you want to stimulate a dlpfc we have to place the electrode at ft uh, uh, positioning according to international 1020 system if you want to get some other areas maybe we have to think about changing which i will be discussing in the later part we have to talk about uh, intensity whereas the duration of the stimulation uh, it's regarding when it talk about the intensity it is uh, maybe 2 milliampere even the studies have used 0.5 1 milliampere and 2 milliampere but optimally if you look into lot of studies it is about 2 milliampere which perhaps which requires a session of around 20 minutes so the duration of uh, stimulation would be around 10 to 20 minutes but optimally we can say that it is 20 minutes so if you look into the neurobiology of that i'll try to explain in the further slides why 20 minutes has been set okay why not 30 minutes why not 5 minutes why not 10 minutes and other so number of sessions per day some studies have reported one uh, session per day would be sufficient uh, to provide the required after effects but some sessions even they try to do some accelerated uh, protocol they follow the accelerated protocols where they give more than two sessions three sessions per day based on the safety as well as the tolerability profile of an individual and interval between the sessions is also important because uh, the after effect sometimes it can uh, uh, cancel out each other and because of which the interval between the sessions are also be vital so this electrode size is very very important because the larger the electrode size the more is the field and the less is the focality but if we see uh, the high definition tdcs the diameter of it is maybe less than 3 uh, cm 3 cm or even 1 cm to for the matter of fact and this will be very focal there we are intending to stimulate it will stimulate only that part of the brain so if we go more uh, if if we want to increase the field perhaps we have to increase the size of the electrode it could be 5 5 into 5 cm 5 into 7 cm 8 into 8 cm and even as large as 10 into 10 10 by 10 cm electrodes are available so as i've already mentioned smaller size increases the focality however uh, there could be some differences because differential shunting of the current occur through the scalp the electrode size varies and greater edge effects uh, relative to the overall area so these are these are some problems which uh, are noted when it comes to tcs so commonly used if you say that uh, if i want to practice something what could i use maybe uh, something around 25 to 35 square centimeter is the most commonly used electrode size so going on to the electrode positioning so if we talk about the electrode positioning it depends on the diagnosis of the patient it depends on which area do we want to stimulate because it is only just on the basis of various experiments researchers randomized control trials where they say that okay i have stimulated a dorsolateral prefrontal cortex i have used anodal uh, electro anode uh, anodal stimulation and i have found some effect so there are lots of meta analysis systematic reviews which says that okay this area if we stimulate perhaps we can get some desired effect and uh, when we try to do the electrode positioning because uh, we know that anatomical localization sometimes it might be very difficult so we try to use international 1020 eeg system 
And if you want to go more uh, advanced, perhaps you can even use neuro navigator, maybe neuro targeting precisely, if I can say, where with the help of various, uh, uh, you can you can just uh, import the patient's MRI into the um, device where there, there are lots of softwares, which will say that, okay, this is the DLPFC, this, are the, this is the temporoparietal junction, this is the orbitofrontal cortex, and there we'll be giving, we'll be placing the ele electrode and we'll provide the desired stimulation. So critical for focal effect, because uh, if we try to use anywhere if uh, as per our interest, so these focal effects will not be effect and, and, and we, can, we can find there will be a lot of dispersion that can occur and this uh, can uh, may not be providing as what we will be requiring. So example, changing electrode reference from DLPFC to M1 eliminates the effects of working memory functions. So these are some experiments which have been done which says that, okay, if you stimulate that area, you'll be able to find some optimization in specific behavioral uh, functioning. So effects are site specific and it is not site limited. There are lots of areas which has not been explored or explored or it is still underexplored. So it is not very, very much site specific and uh, uh, maybe we can do a lot of explorations further as well. So this is the international uh, T20s. Before going into this, I'd like to say this. This is the international N20 system of electrode placement. So this is how we identify the vertex, perhaps the midpoint of, between the nasion and the ineon and the preauricular area and the intersecting point becomes the CZ. And then 20 centimeters, according to the head circumference, we'll try to localize uh, C3, T3, and perhaps even from FZ, we can target F3. So this is purely on the basis of 1020 system. Uh, so maybe with the help of this, we are able to uh, localize uh, where we want to, or uh, where we are intending to stimulate. So if you look into the nasion, ineon, so these are all uh, available in various standard textbooks, as well as we are able to find them in uh, different uh, EG, uh, this thing. So we'll be identifying various areas and based on various research paper, based on the research evidences, we'll be able to provide the stimulation. The intensity of the current is basically what you can say it as uh, more precisely as the current density and is basically the current strength uh, divided by the electrode size. So if, we, if the smaller the electrode size, the, the electrode density will increase as well as the current strength should be somewhere between 1000 to 2000 milli microampere or uh, 1 to 2 milliampere that I've already uh, covered. And the strength would be somewhere between 0.029 to 0 0.08 milliampere per square centimeter in most of the studies because it has to cross so much of like, it has to cross the scalp, it has to cross the skull meninges and then ultimately it has to stimulate the brain. So we have to, we can, we can even simulate the uh, electrical field that can generate so this could be on the basis of a lot of softwares. But if you try to understand it more uh, in terms of the pragmatic aspects, so maybe something between uh, one milliampere to two milliampere would be optimal to simulate the desired brain areas. And gradually there has to be ramping up of the current. If you want to ramp up, then the, there will be lesser skin irritation, there will be lesser chances of AC transients and other stuff. What happens is suddenly if you put that, uh, suddenly if you provide milliampere current, then the patient might have tolerability issues. They will report skin irritation and if it is not practiced uh, in a standard method, perhaps there could be even the risk of burns. There are, there are some patients who come with uh, uh, some burn injuries and other things. So these are, in fact, they're very safe, but sometimes this ramping up has to be taken place. So gradually we have to increase it over the period of maybe 30 seconds or something to provide lesser skin irritation. So going on to the duration of stimulation uh, determines the occurrence and length of the after effects. I'll cover that later on as well. So you can see that even four second stimulation induces an after effects in the cortical excitability and without generating after, sorry, it induces acute effect, but it does not generate any after effects. But if you stimulate the brain for more than three uh, minutes, then necessary for after effects. So more than three minutes, you can see some after effect that is happening inside the cortical structures. And if you stimulate for nine to 13 minutes, and this there could be a stability of the after effects that could last for maybe 30 to even 90 minutes. So duration of stimulus, maybe the relationship between the stimulus duration as well as the duration of after effect, 
people say that it is not linear so it can be chaotic as well so you don't know the exact relationship between the stimulus duration and the stimulation after effect lots of studies say that it will it initially last but somehow there is a it is occurring after a period of maybe 20 to 30 minutes or maybe after 120 minutes example anodal tdcs for 26 minutes results in excitability diminishing but no enhancing after effect that could be seen so anything beyond that also we are not able to find because the the, the, the stimulation can go into a no man's land which i'll be discussing later on so this is because of various uh, neuro, uh, neuronal signaling changes that can occur okay and one more thing is uh, repetitive session can provide long lasting effects this is what is important so it's not just about giving uh, five sessions 10 sessions maybe to provide the lasting effects maybe we can even continue further based on the safety profile or maybe the tolerability profile of an individual so this is just an example which i am uh, uh, portraying here uh, so here a patient is uh, selected with the diagnosis of schizophrenia the anodal uh, electrode is placed over the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex which is the midway between the f3 and f1 and cathode is placed over the left temporoparietal junction which is midway between the p3 and p3 so you can see that uh, uh, we are using uh, 30 uh, in this diagram there is uh, 35 cm per electrodes which is stimulated at an intensity of 2 milliampere and a duration of 20 minutes so these are simple parameters which you can see in various studies that have mentioned uh, the efficacy of uh, tdcs in schizophrenia so when it comes to tdcs in depression uh, people have stimulated dorsolateral prefrontal cortex where the anode is placed over the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and cathode is placed over the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex duration is perhaps around 20 to 30 minutes 2 milliamperes one session daily for 10 days or maybe even more than that based on the evidences so these are all uh, previous evidences which i am sharing currently but if you can uh, look into the latest literature you can even find three weeks uh, sessions or perhaps maybe even a one month session which is provided to patients who are suffering from depression next if you look into the ocd some of the very basic uh, areas i mean some of the very uh, commonly used areas stimulated areas include the anodal stimulation to the left uh, supplementary uh, area which is midpoint of the inner edge of uh, electrode positioning uh, is placed just over the fz and uh, uh, when it comes to the cathode it is a right supraorbital area which is relatively very common in most of the studies this is a study which i am quoting from the match team so uh, studies have been uh, like they have done in uh, my cognitive impairment you can see that uh, the duration of stimulus here is 2 milliampere itself 20 minutes and maybe they have given just for 5 days area of stimulation is left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex so there are lots of areas where we can directly explore to see what are the beneficial effects that could be provided to the patients it is another interesting area where you want to dampen the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex to reduce the craving okay so here we provide cathode stimulation to, to the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and anode stimulation uh, anode electrode will be provided at the uh, right dlpfc so uh, going on to the uh, uh, tdcs uh, stimulation parameters it just about uh, giving a overview of all the uh, uh, diagnosis as well as where are the where the electrodes can be kept so in schizophrenia it is the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex cathode in the left tpj duration 20 minutes and these are the sessions similarly depression left dlpfc cathode at the right dlpfc stimulation for maybe 30 minutes one session day for 10 days so you can define your own uh, protocols you can define your own parameter settings and based on that based on the tolerability and other stuffs and even the recent evidences so you will be able to find some benefit talking about the adverse effect adverse effects aren't very uh, uh, lasting neither they are uh, life threatening but uh, in fact there are some adverse effect that is somewhat a matter of concern commonly mentioned side effects include uh, adverse effects includes uh, mild tingling burning itching sensation which is perhaps on the site of the electrode placement the other thing could be uh, nausea headache can that could be short lasting headache dizziness during the stimulation or maybe immediately after the stimulation 
Phosphines can be generated sometimes. This is an interesting thing which we often find if you stimulate the occipital region uh, with the help of maybe TMS. So perhaps you can find phosphines. But even phosphines have been reported with uh, TDCS as well. It's because of the AC transient causing the neuronal firing at the distant place. And usually safe even uh, in skin conditions like uh, vitiligo, but perhaps in such cases, we have to be a bit careful. It is safe in pediatric as well as in uh, pregnant groups, but uh, long-term safety is yet to be established. There is a one study by Dr. Shiraj et al. who has mentioned the pregnancy, the safety of uh, safety as well as tolerability of uh, uh, TDCS in pregnant mothers. So going on to the safety measures again, so to keep the current amplitude somewhere between one to two milliamperes, so don't go beyond a two milliamperes. Current density, if you understand, it is maybe 0.02 to 0.08 milliampere per centimeter square, and no time limit. But as such, the duration should not cross beyond 20 to 30 minutes. Again, I'm repeating the same gap between the session as per Niche's uh, 2008 guidelines. And patient want minimal uh, side effect and ramping up is very important. Immediately, if we build it up to 2 milliampere, then uh, the patient might not be willing to take TDCS. So this is, uh, again, a chart which says that burning sensation and itching are the most common uh, side effects to TDCS, as other things you can uh, see in the slide. Yeah. So there are certain limitations where you can't be providing uh, TDCS treatment on one go. For example, we have to be cautious in uncontrolled epilepsy. Subjects must have no metallic implants near to the electrodes because that can cause some sort of shunting or maybe that can lead to some adversities. So if someone who has underwent neurosurgical procedures, it is not a very good option to them. Acute eczematous skin lesions because that can cause skin irritation, simulations of uh, deeper brain structure is a limitation again and because it is not used because it requires a lot of cooperation during the stimulation patient has to sit comfortably for maybe more than 20, 20, around 20 to 30 minutes right from the preparation till the stimulation the aggressive and uncooperative patient it won't be a very good choice so going on to more of a neurobiological uh, perspective if we see that when we provide anodal stimulation what happens is uh, the number, the firing of the neurons can go exponentially higher. So the moment the anode is off, the uh, if you look into the B, you can find that this is the neuronal firing on the left side. And when the anode is off, you can see the firing has reduced. And when you talk about the cathode, when the cathode is on, there is dampening, which you can see that is lasting. So this was an important experiment that was conducted way before in 1964, which has found that anodal stimulation can increase the excitability and cathodal stimulation can decrease or dampen the excitability. To go further into it, so if we see, seek into the basics, so if you look into the TDCS per se, it's about when we provide the anodal stimulation, it causes the hyperpolarization of the uh, basal dendrites, or sorry, a hyperpolarization of the apical dendrites. So it is just below the scalp. We try to talk it in more uh, pragmatic, maybe uh, easy method. And if we go to the deeper structures, perhaps uh, the basal dendrites, so there is depolarization. So it is hyperpolarization of the apical dendrites and depolarization of the basal dendrites if you stimulate the brain with the anodal uh, electrode. Suppose what happens with the cathodal, if we, if we use the cathodal uh, uh, stimulation, so it causes depolarization of the apical whereas hyperpolarization of the basal dendrites. That is why there is decreased local connectivity and increased long distance coupling. Whereas in anodal stimulation, it increases the local connectivity and it, uh, the long-lasting connectivity is reduced. Sorry, uh, I, I uh, told it another way, sorry. So you can even see there are lasting changes at the level of electrical current of the cerebral cortex by the polarizing C. You can see the after effects can be there even after, uh, so this is the stimulation which has been provided and this the lasting effect can go in a linear fashion. 
So if we look into the more detailed aspects of the possibility of non-invasive neuromodulation to the motor cortex excitability. So suppose if you provide stimulation to the motor cortex and then if you check the motor evoke potential with the help of transcranial magnetic stimulation, you can see there is a lasting uh, excitability that is seen at the motor cortex. So this excitation is seen with the anodal stimulation and this inhibition where there is dampening of the motor evoke potential that is seen in the cathodal stimulation. So this varying of the current intensity, duration and strength, so you can see that whether the lasting effects could be controlled. So it is amount, it is the intensity, it is the duration as well as it is the site which is very important as well as the choice of electrode is very much important. If you want to stimulate, you provide anodal stimulation. If you want to dampen, provide cathodal stimulation. So if you want, uh, if you think a temporoparietal junction is hyperactive in patients with schizophrenia, we provide cathodal stimulation. And we keep anodal uh, electrode somewhere, uh, uh, maybe in DLPFC or uh, uh, in the so right supraorbital uh, region. And if we think that uh, there is a hypofunctional left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex in depression, so we provide anodal stimulation to left DLPFC, and then a cathode will be placing it on right orbital region. So this is how pragmatically we'll be able to understand where to keep the anodal, which, need, which area needs to be stimulated, which area needs to be dampened. So this is based on the various experiment as well as the protocols. Sorry. Mm. Yeah, go ahead. Fine. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, uh, Mr. Why is this breaking? So, how much? Is, uh, video ban karke dekho ek Umesh, the... your whole this slide was not audible what you are speaking. <coughs> network issues are a network issues are a up to Umesh, you can stop sharing the video. You can stop video and see, you may gain some bandwidth. Okay. Yeah, I think he had to drop out. So he'll be joining again. I'll start sharing the screen. Sorry for the inconvenience. Yes, yes. sure. <coughs> yeah, perhaps I was on this slide, right, sir? Yeah, yeah. Yes, you can start with this. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so uh, I was mentioning about the motor cortex stimulation. So if we use uh, Anodal stimulation, that's what I was mentioning, that there could be excitation of the motor cortex. And if we provide cathodal stimulation, there could be dampening of the motor cortex that is uh, maybe measured with the help of TMS uh, motor evoke potentials. So, yeah, to look into the more details of that. So, how long will the after effect last? So, when it comes to anodal stimulation, so the after effect can return to the baseline after 120 minutes. And when it comes to HTTDCS, the after effects can uh, maybe last up to six hours. And cathodal stimulation, the after effects can reach up to 120 minutes and HTTDCS would be around 360 uh, minutes or maybe up around six hours. So you can see that uh, although uh, the lasting effects aren't very uh, promising in terms of maybe the numbers, but if you continuously maybe stimulate at uh, regular intervals or maybe provide stimulation for maybe uh, uh, one to two stimulations per day, 
maybe for coming uh, one month or uh, 20 days, 21 days, or maybe two, uh, 10 days. So based on that, we'll be able to understand that whether this lasting effect could be there in a patient or not. So it's about uh, why why do we need to understand all these things? It's about when we stimulate the uh, with the help of an anode electrode. So initially, like when there is ramp up and initially when the current starts flowing, it provides a LTD like effect. And then it falls into no man's land where the plasticity doesn't occur. And after few, uh, uh, after few um, time, after some amount of time, because of the increase in con so calcium concentration, it provides a, a LTP-like phenomena, and because of which there could be a, uh, some sort of plasticity that could be happening. But if we continue stimulating for more than thirty minutes, it can again fall into a no man's land too. So that is why we say that only 20 to 30 minutes would be optimal. Otherwise, if we stimulate more than that, then perhaps we can go into a no man's land too. When it comes to cathodal stimulation, we'll start stimulating. It will provide a LTD-like phenomena because it will reduce the uh, uh, calcium concentration and ultimately it will uh, provide some sort of dampening effect. So if we start continuously stimulating the cathodal-like effect, uh, sorry, cathodal stimulation, and it can in turn provide the uh, LTP-like activity, so which is not actually required. So it is very important to know that the duration is perhaps vital. So it is the excitation is basically because of the glutamatergic uh, uh, effect, and uh, the dampening effect would be perhaps because of the activity of GABAergic inhibitions. So HTTTCS is very important because uh, as you can see that there will be a lot of shunting, there will be a lot of uh, uh, what you can see, the electrical field seems to be pretty uh, uh, diverse, a uh, lot of spreading can occur because of the conventional TDCS. So HTTTCS is quite uh, important because uh, the it has a ring-like structure where the 4 into 1 structure where you'll be providing the simulation in such a fashion four of the electrodes one is the entry electrode the other one are the exiting for example this one is the anode the center one and the other one the four ele exiting electrodes are cathodal electrode so the if the anodal stimulation is 2 milliamperes so equally the other electrodes will be receiving the current that is 0.5 milliamperes 0 0.5 0 0.5 and 0.5 so in this way we are able to even modify and that could be fully uneven, it could be partially uneven, or it could be even distribution of the current. So uh, based on this, we can increase the focality of the desired array. But problem with HTTDCS is it is slightly bulkier as compared to the conventional TDCS, and it is uh, expensive. So this is the uh, diagram which I am sharing from the SimNips. There is a simulation where you can see that if you want to stimulate, uh, if you want to create a field, simulated field, you can see the maximum amount of the field that is generated is around F3. Whereas the other uh, regions, the AF3, F7, FC5, and uh, uh, we, we are not able to find much of the field distribution, electric field distribution. So it is uh, very, very focal. So this is what is very, uh, I want to share. So there are lots of computation models that has been used to understand the electrical flow inside the brain. The models are built based on the MRI of a human head to capture uh, details of the individual the anatomy. So what we do is we take the MRI cans, the MRI segmented, virtual electrodes are placed on the anatomical model. The volume is subsequently tessellated in the mesh and subsequently the estimation of the current flow is measured. So here we can see that as because individually there is a lot of uh, inter-individual variability when it comes to the spread of the current from the scalp to the uh, uh, cortical surface. So based on that, we'll be able to precisely mention as to what amount of electrical field that is currently generated because of the stimulation of this area. So this is currently available even in open source uh, uh, platform. So overall, to conclude, uh, TDCS biomarkers, as is when it comes to clinical, neurobiological, and uh, findings from the animal models, it supports there is a definite link in the neurobiological mechanism as well as it has a behavioral effect. The dosage can be optimized using various computation methods. 
of electrical flow as well as by understanding the various dose response uh, parameters and maybe in the future we can see something like this where the where tdcs could be monitored uh, through a webcam and it could be something like a doctor controlling the various stimulation parameters and the patient is taking something uh, like a tdcs at home so we still might be expecting a lot of changes in the future thank you thanks a lot Thank you so much, Umesh. Over to chairpersons for their opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Umesh, for a very chart and crisp uh, presentation of this TDCS uh, transcranial direct current stimulation. Just, uh, uh, I think uh, you have left this uh, uh, alternate current stimulation and this uh, random noise cancellation because they are uh, beyond the purview of this topic. But uh, I want the indications, just what are the current indications of uh, 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 of psychiatric disturbances that can be managed along with the TDCS with or without drugs as a supplement. It's okay, a sir. Question from me. Yes, sir. Uh, so thank you for the question, sir. This is a very important and a very uh, uh, valid uh, question because uh, uh, whenever we get a patient, suppose whether we are, uh, it is, is it required to start TDCS in that? patient or not that's one question which uh, commonly arises but uh, whenever a patient comes suppose if a patient comes with schizophrenia who has persistent auditory hallucinations so which is not uh, currently uh, there's no change that has occurred because of the conventional pharmacological treatment so then we can think of using uh, HTTDCS or maybe TDCS in the temporoparietal junction and then we can see that there could be some changes in the uh, frequency or severity of the voices or auditory hallucinations and if suppose if the patient is having uh, depression, so we can use uh, TDCS to augment the effect of uh, the various antidepressants, or we can even think of uh, providing uh, TDCS along with the psychotherapeutic interventions. So this depends on the uh, case to case, sir. So ultimately it's the clinician's choice or the clinician's decision by practicing various uh, standard protocols and uh, based on um, the requirement of the patient, we can try to modulate what is required. Okay, then what are the off-label or the other, uh, new, probably the neuropsychiatric indication, not purely psychiatric, because they are even indicating for uh, resistant uh, seizures, uh, refractory seizures, uh, stroke, hmm. uh, and aphasia, other things they are uh, uh, yes. recommending it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Basically, if you look into the neuroplasticity and other models, so it, it even to post stroke rehabilitation, people have been using, people have been using even for the treatment of migraine for that matter. And uh, even uh, if we uh, check in dementia, there are studies which are mentioning that uh, it can enhance the cognition to a certain extent. So these are the various neuropsychiatric indications, perhaps in even MCI people have been using. So you can, I mean, uh, the sky is the limit, perhaps if you can see the number of indications. Sir. So. Uh, it, it is, uh, in fact, when it comes to treatment resistant epilepsy, I'm uh, really unaware about that. Maybe it's a very interesting thing I would be learning more because uh, uh, TMS, we have already done one study at CIP, sir, where uh, focal seizures, uh, which was non which was going more into the resistance and uh, patients were not uh, getting managed with uh, more than three pharmacological, psychopharmacological agents. So we tried uh, uh, CTBS in that patients, in those patients. So that has actually, uh, there, were, there were some findings which is currently uh, in the, under preparation, the, the, the study which is uh, yet to be submitted, sir. The good to hear the new information. Go <coughs> to our, uh, my coach, our Rani, sir. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Umesh, for the very detailed presentation on this very interesting and fascinating uh, uh, modality of treatment. And as you said, going ahead, probably we'll see larger indications and larger use of this. Uh, what would interest me to know is, despite of this uh, increasing evidence for this modality, what are the effect sizes of, of mm -hmm. this uh, intervention? Uh, if we see the latest uh, uh, meta-analysis, sir, so we can we can at least say small to more medium effect size if we uh, just make it in a broader sense. So I would consider it has a small to moderate medium effect size. 
So given that small to medium size effect uh, of this modality, then where would we find a place for this in a uh, increasing armamentarium to treat mental health issues? We know it's very complex. So where would be the niche for this place? Uh, yes, sir. So uh, initially we can start the pharmacological agents and then we have very specific set of symptoms, which is actually uh, causing distress to the patient. For example, if there are specific cognitive symptoms that is currently, which is not getting treated with the help of the conventional treatment, or there are persistent auditory hallucination despite on treatment, where we are not in a position to augment with any other further agents because uh, they are vulnerable to side effects. So in such cases, non-invasive brain stimulation would be providing some sort of a, a augment uh, to the existing uh, treatment, what I can understand. But standalone, I'm not very sure about that. Sir. Standalone treatment is not very I mean, so promising. In, in, in your center, you'll have this modality and, and uh, how what do you use it largely for besides the research? Uh, so, uh, sorry, sir, there was a bit of... Uh, uh, can you please... In your, in your center, do you all have this setup? And uh, yes, if yes. you'll have... You'll use it besides the research clinically. What are your, your experiences, if you could share with uh, the audience? Yes, sir. So uh, clinically, uh, as a part of research, we are doing it on routine basis. Uh, uh, there are various uh, thesis topics which has been allotted to our residents. Apart from that, clinically also we have been using in some of the patients where, suppose if you find a patient with treatment resistant schizophrenia, and if you find there are very specific set of symptoms which aren't getting uh, treated with the existing uh, uh, regime. So in such patients, we are finding some sort of benefit in uh, okay. by using TDCS. Okay. So apart from that, uh, there are some studies from my, uh, uh, my friend who has done, if suppose if the patient is not, uh, is, is pregnant, is currently a pregnant mother. Yes. So, we are not we, we don't have the free hands to give so many many medications so ect yes definitely it's a good choice people say that there has been a lot of evidence even tdcs has been like said uh, to be one of the safest safer charts when it comes to so maybe there could be some conditions which would be rather uh, indicated uh, so this yes, is very probably so it is going ahead we will yeah, Absolutely. Is, but I'm not too sure, doc, Dr. Umesh, if in pregnancy there is uh, 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 a consensus on the using of uh, TDCS in pregnancy, uh, whether it's a safe choice. You, there's some kind of uh, caveat yeah. over there, probably. Yes. Uh, yes, yes. But I, I'm sure the audience, a lot of them have questions in the chat box of the moderators would want to take those up. So, Ali. Thank you, sir. Huh. Let me start. Sure. So, Umesh, I'll ask only one question which Sarah has been asking. So, where do you think it works best? Uh, if, if you were suffering from illness, where would you write in your will that please give me this TDCS if I'm suffering from this? Which, would, would, what would be the condition? <laughs> it would be uh, mostly depression, sir. Depression, left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and oral stimulation. Only depression. Ha, and uh, schizophrenia, currently, uh, we are doing a trial. Uh, the CRC project, we are having this uh, 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 persistent auditory hallucinations in schizophrenia. So there, uh, we, are, we are trying to uh, use some of the modalities. So especially TMS, we have been primarily targeting. But uh, depression, yes, I would agree with uh, TDCS. So two sessions a day. Huh. How many two days? Sessions, two sessions a day, maybe uh, ten days to maybe up to three weeks. Cost कितना आता है? Uh, cost depend करता है sir. It is like uh, yeah, average. Uh, we, we, everybody will ask us if we give them an option. Yeah. Between yeah. versus this, what would you prefer? Yeah, yeah. Because ours is a public sector. We don't charge anything. And uh, if it is uh, private sector, I am really unaware about this, sir. So, what is the cost of the machine and setup? Cost depends on uh, uh, usually, sir. It is uh, maybe in some lakhs. So, depends on the quality of the product. Depends on which uh, the make, the company, and other stuffs. And uh, ultimately, it is the decision of the uh, team who is planning to procure that. Okay. Okay. But so, the handheld device is uh, quite uh, useful. 
So it's just a small piece of uh, machine. Device. So, so how much roughly roughly how much it cost? Uh, I'm really not very sure, sir. If I I'll just go through the various. Uh, uh, this thing and then i'll be able to get back to the one who can i think for the institute they use a little cost expensive machines because it's yeah, for yeah. a lot of parameters are there even yeah. if you look at rtms machine ect machine you know there's a lot of difference between so, so how long have you been using uh, umish uh, uh, the institute has been using star stream i think sir we have been using since 2015 perhaps so how many times there has been a breakdown and uh, how many times was it needed to be repaired so actually, uh, when it comes to the maintenance part, it is uh, not very difficult to maintain. So because it's only about two DC uh, uh, cells. So it is just about taking some Everready or maybe Badura cell and other things, just place it. And when it is done, you just have to replace the batteries. So the only battery. problem is the, the, the rubber uh, electrodes. So that sometimes has, uh, it, it undergoes wear and tear and so those things needs to be replaced, but otherwise uh, there's no much uh, cost in the maintenance. It's relatively a cheaper device. Okay. And Umish, uh, you people are also using RTMS there. Yes, so, exactly. Sir. Yeah. So, so I think that is much more costly than this. That is largely expensive as compared to TDCS devices, sir. So in fact, uh, uh, and it requires a, a very, a very uh, sophisticated setup as compared to the TDCS devices. So when it comes to RTMS, perhaps uh, it requires a lot of uh, this thing. Current uh, has to be; it has to be properly insulated. So many things are there. So it requires a very uh, the 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 laboratory has to be very sophisticated. Okay. But TDCS, maybe any small room is sufficient. So how many centers uh, may be using it? Suppose CIP is using it. So CIP is using, Nimans is using, I think, I think many of the centers would be, uh, because a lot of places is, in Mumbai and all are using it alone. A no. lot of places in Mumbai are using it. Yeah. They are using it in many places. Because it is uh, portable, easy to use, and uh, it is uh, perhaps efficacious in different conditions. Okay. So Amrit, questions on the chat box now? Yeah, let's take some questions. So Talha has asked, minimum and maximum age for using it on any specific contraindication? Minimum age, I think uh, uh, there are a few studies which has used even in children. I'm not sure about that, but maximum age, even patients with dementia, there have been reports which has been mentioned. So uh, I'm not sure about the age range, but uh, preferably it depends upon the tolerability as well as uh, the previous researches which has used in that particular condition and that age group. That is rather more important as compared to if we try to experiment, perhaps maybe it is a bit trickier thing. So children, I'm not very sure uh, because we are not uh, very commonly using that in the child and adolescent population. Talal asked another question, Ali. Post procedure, yeah. anything to be looked for? Can patient be sent immediately home? Can patient go and drive? His, can patient come driving and take a TDCS and go back uh, after that? And should yeah. consent be taken? And if yes, oral or written? Uh, so the lasting, if you, if you talk about the lasting effects, so the after effects per se, yeah, yeah. so it, it may be up lasting up to uh, three to six hours. So uh, if we talk in terms of pragmatics, maybe the patient will not report anything after the EC, I mean, a TDCS session. So maybe if we just monitor him for a half an hour or so, or maybe maximum to around one hour, because nothing will happen. Only patients, some patients might experience dizziness. And after that, if the patient says, no, I'm fine now, maybe it will be easier for them to get back to their home. So yeah, daycare, definitely it would be a very good option. Okay. And any specific consent has been to be taken? Of course, sir. I think consent uh, would be required in this, uh, because it's a newer yeah. modality. Yeah. So, so perhaps the consent has to be taken. Okay. So do you have a consent form? If you can share it, we can. Yeah, I would be. Yeah, yeah, we can share the consent form as well. As per the. Okay. So every time you need to take a consent, or one consent for all the sessions is enough. One consent for all the sessions would be enough. That's what I understand. It's about the. Uh, 
the we are using some uh, method of treatment so that is rather it's, it will be similar to that of ect so you if the patient consents for ect so we'll give them ect the patient consents for tdcs we'll give them tdcs so do we need an uh, john wants to ask do we need an eeg technician to place the electrodes or uh, and can any scalp uh, cap be obtained so that we can do it by ourselves uh, sir, it is very easy to apply, identify which area do we need to uh, stimulate because it's about following the International 1020 system. It is very easy. You just have to take the head circumference and then you have to take the distance from the nasion to the inion and the preauricular region. You will find the vertex and from the vertex, you'll have to just take the 20, 1020 system, just about uh, the head circumference, 20% or 10% so you'll be able to identify the F3, C3, Jobi upper area of interest, that you'll be able to stimulate. Yeah, actually, just, just this 1021 has to be. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. we just need to know that international 1020 system of electrode placement. Sure. And it is not a tough thing. People not should. Not tough. It not is not very tough. easy if you do it a few times. It is very easy for you. Yes, sir. Amrit. Have you ever tried it on mania? <laughs> uh, it would be difficult, sir, because the patient has to sit comfortably for 20 to 30 minutes. So, uh, slightly difficult job. But uh, if a patient initially gets stabilized with medications and some residual symptoms would be there, then maybe we can think of uh, using cathodal stimulation, perhaps. I'm not I'm not sure. It's just a uh, thought which I got. So, oh, I sedated a patient and gave a TDCS. How will it be? Uh, now, sitting comfortably. now you tell me whether it will act or not. I think the, the effects will go to the brain, <laughs> but uh, I'm not sure. It would be a high confounding factor. <laughs> so we'll not be knowing as to what uh, effect it is providing because you are treating something. The, the, because, because when it give online a TDCA session, sir, because it is said that you can't even provide the newspapers. Because some centers, they give newspapers, they give uh, TV sessions and they'll project some uh, serials on the TV just to entertain the patient and other things. But in fact, when you provide this, it will also can have some effects on the cortical structures. So it can have additive, it can have some uh, uh, maybe jeopardizing effect. We don't know what is actually, but exactly it will happen. Probably, probably it might not work because your... Mm -hmm. Uh, you, your mechanism is either depolarizing or hyperpolarizing the neurons. And once you're sedated a patient, you've already done it mm -hmm. chemically. Yeah. You've already will, done it chemically. How will you exclude so, this uh, placebo effect? Sir? Placebo, placebo effect. How, how can we exclude it? How can we be confident that it's not, uh, the improvement is not due to placebo effect? Uh, sir, uh, yes, this is this is definitely a matter of debate because any brain stimulation methods has uh, had the placebo effect into the mind. So uh, the effect seems to be slightly more than the placebo effect, what I can understand, sir. And uh, this effect could be lasting and uh, uh, we have uh, certain evidences maybe in terms of uh, fMRI changes or perhaps EEG, you can find there could be some changes that can occur. So, uh, clinically, we might expect some effects, but uh, neurobiologically, there are evidences which says that, okay, it hits the brain, it stimulates the brain, and there could be some changes that is occurring. So, so do we do uh, sham TD, uh, TDCS? Yes, sir. We, yeah, there, is, there is sham TDCS. Sir. So, it so is just I'll, like... I'll perhaps, comparing that, uh, you can... Yeah, yeah. Here, what we do, sir, ki we just provide the treatment for maybe 30 seconds. There is an initial pin click like sensation and it goes down. So the patient has like, he has kept uh, the electrode on the uh, scalp, but uh, the patient will not be receiving any electrical current, any, any uh, stimulation. So, have so, you so had any head to head trials with the RTMS? Have you, have, have you under, uh, done a, a control study with the RTMS and TTS here? Uh, sir, we are currently undergoing that. So, uh, yeah, so perhaps we might come with some open label uh, findings uh, shortly. So, maybe TDCS primed RTMS, they're all there. 
so there is one group which will receive that and so that's what we we request uh, the uh, viewers to uh, maybe refer the patient who are suffering from persistent auditory hallucination treatment resistant schizophrenia treatment resistant depression to either nimhans or cip ranchi or kmc manipal who can like get benefited from this uh, particular project okay. where they will be provided either tms or tdcs or uh, ect with close up pins okay. so maybe we can help the other patients as well with the findings that we are getting here uh, dr ramesh one question comes to my mind is sorry what about the fda approval is this recognized as a way of treatment for whether depression or resistant schizophrenia no sir FDA approval. It is there is no uh, specific like uh, what we find it for RTMS like FDA approved for depression, OCD, and other stuff. What we find it, sir, and maybe schizophrenia, TDCS. We don't have any uh, FDA approval per se. What you can say, but it's only based on the uh, standard guidelines. Maybe so, various guidelines if you can follow. So only based on that we are able to uh, maybe use this device. But FDA approval, no sir, we don't have anything like that for TDCS per se. So, uh, Doctor Imran, to ask, how many sessions does it uh, take to see clinical improvement? And let me add, uh, you saying that effects last for uh, <coughs> two to three hours up to six hours. So, how do we measure that effect? Uh, how do we say that the effect? Uh, what, what is the effect that there for few hours, and how? Uh, how many sessions would take a clinical effect so clinical effect uh, we are we can't find it in every patient but uh, in some patient they do report that there is improvement in the mood maybe the frequency the distress of the auditory hallucination has reduced so if you just try to measure them on ahrs perhaps there could be some changes in the uh, scores so we can see it in terms of experimentation or maybe uh, research part they will report some improvement in some of the other domains but clinically the patient might report some changes in his mood state or something like that so that the patient uh, might 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 say to us sir mujhe acha lag raha hai treatment lene ke baad mein main pehle utna man nahi lagta tha ab man lagne laga hai ya concentrate kar pa raha hu this type of things they might be reporting which should be very much behavioral but measurable uh, we can see it with the help of very much like a reading scale or so where exactly the changes have been occurring Okay, uh, Tala wants to ask: Are there any workshops going on for this? <laughs> yes, sir. So, in fact, uh, uh, we have been uh, like uh, TDCS RTMS uh, workshop is currently been scheduled at uh, uh, the National Midterm CME, which will be held uh, at Raipur on twenty seven to twenty ninth of uh, uh, August this month. After two weeks. so apart from that we also uh, plan to organize a lot of workshops at uh, cip in the future so interested uh, maybe they can visit cip and they can even they could be lot of observation uh, learning as well maybe they can just uh, write a letter to us perhaps uh, for a visit to cip and maybe they can observe what treatment we have been providing to the patients uh, in fact ips new courses committee is uh, also planning something on this exactly so neuromodulation uh, task uh, it was actually planned initially but because of covid we had to shift to the sleep certification course so yes. maybe they'll contact you in hand in hands for conducting this workshop yes yeah nimans runs uh, nibs hands on it has mentioned that uh, yeah they run uh, yeah dr shriraj dr uh, uh, urvak sir and all they they have that uh, training and as a part of uh, fellowship we also uh, have lot of uh, training to our fellows currently who are enrolled in the crtp as uh, clinical research center for neuro modulation psychiatry uh, in fact ips is coming out with this guideline for tdcs so mm -hmm. uh, was in the meeting it is a very handy thing that they have made mm -hmm. the one question which alim you had asked already uh, difference between tdcs and rtms in terms of parameters cost oh, there's a, there's a very very big one. let me let me yeah uh, yes sir so uh, that is one interesting thing i if if uh, allow me to share one uh, uh, slide sir if you say please please, please. we would yeah, love that yeah. just uh, one second sir i'll just uh, share that <laughs> uh, 
Oh, sorry. Okay, I, in the meanwhile, I'll take other questions, sir. So I'll just, uh, so that to save time. No, it's okay. You take your time, mate. You take one second. So again, another question from Tala Shamin. Where to, from where one can get the machine? <laughs> in the website, I think there are lots of options, sir. So maybe they can just uh, go browse the website and uh, we'll be able to find a uh, lot of of TDCS and other things. Yeah, and when to terminate the sessions? Uh, sir, it's about uh, the clinician's decision itself. So if the effect is lasting, if it is in the improving trend, maybe we can think of continuing that. But when there is a sort of what we practice for the ECT, suppose if the effect aren't being maintained for over a period of time, then and it's also depending on the uh, papers which mention that okay this is the time frame in which i'll be giving the treatment maybe beyond that it won't be a good choice for me so in in that way perhaps you can think of uh, uh, how, how long are we able to provide the treatment to the patients dr shivanan wants to ask which machine is being used at Star Stim HDC kit and currently Sorterix. So, बहुत प्रश्न पूछ लिए. आपके में जो स्लाइड है है आ गया? वही हम हम देख रहे हैं एक सेकंड हाँ वन सेकंड. just share the clip. Yeah yeah yeah. One second, sir. There is some. Sir, is it visible? You go yes, for sir. the full screen. Full screens. Yeah. yeah so if you compare RTMS with TDCS, sir, the portability, it is pretty low when it comes to RTMS and it is very high for TDCS. Device cost is expensive. RTMS, it's very affordable uh, when it comes to TDCS. Treatment cost is expensive. TDCS is moderate based on the uh, Western uh, uh, literature easiness e uh, of use is low whereas it is very high for uh, the use i mean the ease at which it could be used is higher for uh, tdcs equitable access is difficult it is quite possible with tdcs mechanism of action is like it's more uh, related to the uh, action potential on and it's more about the resting membrane potential spatial resolution is good with uh, rtms which is it's poor with uh, TDCS because there is lots of distribution that occurs. Temporal resolution is good with RTMS. It's poor with TDCS. After effect is very short for TMS, but it is longer for TDCS. And uh, uh, maybe, oh, sorry. The side effects, the severe adver adverse effects are rare, but possible in, for RTMS, but it is non-existing as per the previous reports in TDCS. Sir. So, if you look into the carryover effect, both are unclear. So we don't know whether, how long will this effect last? Yeah, so, thank you. Okay, okay. So I think we have <coughs> covered the questions. Yeah. And Dr. Shivanand also wants to ask, uh, <coughs> what protocol are you following at your institute? Uh, protocol, I'm not very clear as to what was the preci precise, uh, well, what, 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 what is the intent of, uh, like, I didn't understand the question, sir. Protocol means... Uh, mm. 
I am asking him to unmute. So if he's able to unmute and ask. Dr. Shivanand, please. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, the protocol of the procedure, sir, like how to prepare the patient, like if they have a protocol, uh, they can share uh, with us because even if, at our institute in Hubli, Karnataka, we are getting the machine. So we are the beginners. Uh, if we can get the protocol and the uh, consent form, it will be uh, easier for us to uh, begin with the procedures. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely share the... Uh, perhaps if you can, I, I'll share my email ID. Uh, it would be uh, great. Uh, this thing, if you can uh, tell us the yes, sir, that would be great. Mm. Yeah, please share your email ID so that people can contact you directly. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. So we'll be able to share in this uh, as per your requirements, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do you still use Hotmail? <laughs> 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 yeah, it is Outlook uh, compatible, sir. So that is why Microsoft 365, that is the reason. Okay, so I think we have covered the question, Samrit. Uh, any uh, comments from the chairpersons? Uh, and then we can go to Tofan, Tofan Pati, sir. Yes, uh, I personally thank uh, the series chairman, Dr. Tofan Pati, and the excellent moderators, Dr. Uh, Amrit and uh, Dr. Alim and my co-chair, Dr. Rane, for giving me this opportunity and uh, having a good interaction. It was a simply extended classroom for me. So I enjoyed this session. Uh, special thanks to Dr. Umesh, who is uh, having hands-on experience and he has taught us something about a new innovative non-invasive treatment, which, we'll, uh, which we expect to be very useful. And uh, we, I, my personal opinion is if anybody has a portable instrument at their home, just like a CPAP or other instrument uh, by uh, this uh, blood uh, uh, glucometer or other thing, they can use it when, whenever uh, they can use it. If this is designed like that, uh, it will be a very wonderful innovation for uh, patients who are suffering a lot. I once again thank Dr. Thopan for giving me this opportunity. Over to Dr. Rani. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kumanan. Uh, I share your sentiments. I thank the the, the team, Dr. Tofan and everybody else for uh, inviting me here and Dr. Omesh for this very detailed presentation. And uh, let us hope as you uh, that, you know, the last slide that you showed was very interesting with that man and that woman with those two things, uh, almost like a headband and wearing around. Why only for depressed patients or the psychotic patient? Maybe even uh, we on day-to-day -day practice might start using it for, for some way or the other. So this uh, is a very interesting field. It's a very interesting field, just that we do not have much uh, robust uh, efficacy as yet in the way that it is being used. So as we learn more about this field, I'm sure FDA approvals will also come for certain specific indications. Going ahead, we'll also understand the long-term side effects because uh, it's highly, uh, it, it works by excitation to glutamate and we know it is can be neurotoxic in some conditions. So we will learn the side effects of long-term use also. So is there an audio stop? Somewhere it has stopped. Dr. Rane? Dr. Amrit has to unmute. His uh, audio is muted. So, fans are over to you. Okay, thank you. It has been a very fascinating session. Uh, my take will be like this, that uh, TDCS is a new method of treatment. And any new method of treatment is a non-invasive intervention. And as pairs to be quite specific to the point of lesson, and it is relatively safe, though we don't have a robust proof that it is efficacious, and, but it needs to be tried. We are at this point at a level where there are many methods of treatment available for us. And still all taken together, we do not have a assured certain answer to the diverse problems in psychiatry. And anything that comes up is welcome. And Dr. Omesh has given a very nice presentation. It is highly alluring <laughs> that low cost, 
and uh, appears to be specific, appears to be efficacious. One can have it in private practice. But I think there can be limitations of the medical legal aspect. When we write, how much you can stand that we have written this, although it has not been approved as an indication for this. That one has to work out, and our research positive results will get that. I don't want to put this as a question in the group, but it's my observation. Thanks, everybody, and thanks, Dr. Kumaran, for accepting to be here. We are enriched by your presence. And Dr. Rane, thank you very much. We lost you at the end of your talk. You can yeah, complete Thank you, you, sir. Anything to convey, you can complete it. Thank you, sir. Amir. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Amir. You gave thank us you, a sir. good criticism. We will, when, when we go to the midterm semi, we will be better equipped. Me and Ali <laughs> must be. We, we are getting mannequins yeah. and other things, sir. Hopefully it will not, not be, it will not be Greek. It will not be Greek and Latin to us at least. Thank you, Kumaran sir. Sir, आज आज कोशिश किए हैं थोड़ा सा मतलब सिंपल रखने का पता नहीं कितना ये था. It was very good. simple. में भी ठीक हो गया हम लोग के लिए. If thank I have not done, sir. Thank you, Doctor Kumaran sir. You have thank been wonderful. Thank you, thank you, sir. 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 Thank you